hearing of the Congressional Executive Commission, Committee, Commission on China uh, will come to order. The title of the hearing is Surveillance, Suppression, and Mass Detention, Xing, Xinjiang Human Rights Crisis. We have two panels testifying today. The first panel will feature Ambassador Kelly Curry, the representative of the United States on the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, United States Mission to the United Nations, and Anthony Cristino III, who's the Director of the Foreign Policy Division, Office of Nonproliferation and Treaty Compliance, Bureau of Industry and Security in the U.S. Department of Commerce. We'll have a second panel, uh, Gulchera Oja, Oja, Uyghur, Service Journalist, Radio Free Asia, Ryan Thumb, an Associate Professor at Loyola University, New Orleans, and Jessica Batke, senior editor at China File and a former research analyst at the U.S. Department of State. And I want to thank you for being here. Um, I know one of our initial panel witnesses is delayed, as happens uh, in this great city that we call our nation's capital, but um, we're going to begin and we'll accommodate that accordingly. I want to begin by noting that this hearing is set against the backdrop this week of Secretary Pompeo and Ambassador uh, for International Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback, convening the first ever State Department ministerial to advance international religious freedom, an event which has brought together senior representatives from more than 70 governments around the world to discuss areas of collaboration and partnership in the cause of religious freedom globally. Secretary Pompeo uh, penned an opinion piece in the USA Today earlier this week highlighting the ministerial and the importance of advancing religious freedom globally. Of note, he specifically mentioned Ms. Gulchera and family. While the Chinese government and the Communist Party are equal opportunity oppressors, targeting unregistered and registered Christians, Tibetan, Buddhists, Falun Gong practitioners, and others with harassment, detention, imprisonment, and more, the current human rights crisis unfolding in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region targeting Muslim minority groups is arguably among the worst, if not the most severe instances in the world today of an authoritarian government brutally and systematically targeting a minority faith community. This is an issue which the Commission has seized, with for, which the Commission has been dealing with for some time. In April, we wrote U.S. Ambassador to China, Terry Branstad, urging him to prioritize this crackdown in his interactions with the Chinese government and that he begin collecting information to make the case for possible application of global Magnitsky sanctions against senior government and party officials in the region, including Cheng Chuan Guo, the current Xinjiang Communist Party secretary. The Commission's forthcoming annual report, set to be released this October, will prominently feature the grave and deteriorating situation we will cover here today. While our experts, while our expert witnesses will discuss the situation in greater detail, I want to take a few minutes to paint a picture of life in Xinjiang. For months now, there have been credible estimates of between 800,000 to 1 million people from this region being held at political re-education centers or camps, which are fortified with barbed wire, bomb-proof surfaces, reinforced doors, and guard rooms. Security personnel at these facilities, at these camps, have subjected detainees to torture, to medical neglect and maltreatment, to solitary confinement, to sleep deprivation, to lack of adequate clothing and cold temperatures, and other forms of abuse resulting in the death of some of these detainees. According to one news source, the internment program aims to re rewire the political thinking of detainees, erase their Islamic beliefs, and reshape their very identities. The camps have expanded rapidly over the past year with almost no judicial process or legal paperwork. Detainees who most vigorously criticize the people and things they love are rewarded, and those who refuse to do so are punished with solitary confinement, with beatings, and food deprivation. That was a quote from the media coverage of this, end quote. Some local officials in the region have used chilling political rhetoric to describe the very purpose of the arbitrary detentions of Uyghur Muslims and members of other Muslim ethnic minority groups these are the terms they've used, eradicating tumors or spraying chemicals on crops to, quote, kill the weeds. One expert who was testifying today described Xinjiang Uyghur as, described Uyghur Xinjiang as a police state to rival North Korea with a formalized racism on the order of South African apartheid. While the Chinese government has repeatedly denied knowledge of the camps, a groundbreaking report 
by Adrian Zenz, a scholar at the European School of Culture and Theology published through the Jamestown Foundation in May, found that Chinese authorities were soliciting public bids for the construction of additional camps and the addition of security elements to existing facilities. I would submit this report for the record and would also note the Google Earth footage behind me, which clearly, that's the Google Earth, uh, that's the picture, right? And that Google Earth footage behind me clearly shows the construction of these camps over the span of several months. Those not subject to transformation through education, as they call it, in these detention facilities still face daily intrusions in their home life. This includes compulsory, quote unquote, homestays, whereby Communist Party officials and government workers are sent to live with local Uyghur and Kazakh families. The data-driven surveillance in Xinjiang is assisted by iris and body scanners, voice pattern analyzers, DNA sequencers, and facial recognition cameras in neighborhoods, on roads, or in train stations. Two large Chinese firms, Hikvision and Dahua Technology, have profited greatly from the surge in security spending, reportedly winning upwards of $1.2 billion in government, Chinese government contracts for large-scale surveillance projects. Authorities employ handheld devices to search smartphones for encrypted chat apps and require residents to install monitoring applications on their cell phones. More traditional security measures are also employed. That includes extensive police checkpoints. The rise in security personnel is also accompanied by the proliferation of convenience police stations. That's also within quotes, convenience police stations. A dense network of street corner, village, or neighborhood police stations that enhance authorities' ability to closely surveil and police local communities. Just this month, reports emerged of officials in a humiliating public act, cutting the skirts and even long shirts of Uyghur women on the spot as they walked through local streets. They did so as a means of enforcing a ban on ethnic minorities wearing long skirts. And yesterday, there was an analysis released by the NGO Chinese Human Rights Defenders indicating that 21% of arrests in China last year were in Xinjiang, which is only 1.5% of the population. 21% of the arrests last year in all of China concentrated in an area with 1.5% of the population. The number of arrests increased 731% over the previous year and that does not include the detentions of those in the quote unquote political re-education centers, which are carried out extra legally. Radio Free Asia has led the way in reporting on the crisis, and that has not come without a cost. Developments in Xinjiang have had a direct impact on US interests, most notably the detention of dozens of family members of US-based Uyghur journalists employed by Radio Free Asia, as well as the detention of dozens of family members a prominent Uyghur rights activist, Rebeya Kadir, in an apparent attempt by the Chinese government to silence effective reporting and rights advocacy. We are delighted that RFA journalist Gul Chera Oja is able to join us today to speak to her personal experience in this regard. The commission has convened a series of hearings focused on the long arm of China, and that dimension certainly exists as it relates to the Uyghur diaspora community, including right here in the United States. With that, I want to welcome our witnesses. I, uh, why don't I start with you, Mr. Cristino, since uh, Ambassador Curry, uh, no, I know, but I want to give her a second to catch up. I saw her walk in. Why don't we start with you? I was late a few minutes as well. I know it takes time to put it all together. So welcome, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Chairman Rubio, Chairman Smith, and other members of the Commission on China for convening this hearing today on this important topic. Today I'll discuss the role of the Bureau of Industry and Security regarding export license requirements for China. Under the Export Administration Regulations, known as the EAR, a Bureau of Industry and Security license is required for the export or re-export of most items on the commerce control list to China. Items on the CCL are identified by their individually assigned export control classification numbers according to their reasons for control such as crime control and detection, known as crime control. The 
Commerce control list is comp also comprised of items controlled by the multilateral export control regime, such as the Vassanar arrangement, the missile technology control regime, uh, the Australia group and the nuclear suppliers group, as well as items controlled unilaterally for foreign policy reasons. And here I would draw the distinction with the crime controls. They are, in fact, unilateral, uh, unlike controls over nuclear items um, and other items that would be of uh, concern for security reasons to our international partners and therefore controlled on one of the regimes. Uh, in support of U.S. foreign policy, specifically to promote the observance of human rights throughout the world, the United States controls items on the uh, commerce control list as required by Section 6X of the Export Administration Act uh, as amended. Uh, as set forth in the Export Administration regulations, the U.S. government requires a license to export most crime control and detection instruments, equipment, related technology and software to all destinations other than uh, our closest allies, such as NATO members, Australia, Japan, et cetera. Additionally, a license is required to export certain crime control items, including restraint type devices, such as handcuffs, and discharge type arms, such as stun guns, to all destinations, with the single exception of Canada. The Export Administration regulations impose limited controls on some items not on the commerce control list. Items subject to commerce licensing jurisdiction under our regulations, but not specifically identified on the control list, are designated as EAR 99. Such items generally do not require a license for export or re-export to China unless destined to weapons of mass destruction related end uses or end users, or unless the items are part of a transaction involving a restricted party identified on one of several lists uh, or maintained by agencies of the U.S. government, including the Bureau of Industry and Securities Entity List, the Department of State's Restricted List, and the Department of the Treasury's Specially Designated Nationals List. Items controlled for crime control reasons are added to or removed from the CCL based on continuous review of the merits of maintaining the controls and the effectiveness of the controls. Section 6 of the EAA prohibits the imposition of foreign policy controls, including crime control items, unless certain determinations are made and certain factors reported to Congress, such as the determination that controls are likely to achieve the intended foreign policy objective, a description of consultative efforts with industry and other supplier countries, uh, and determinations related to the economic impact on U.S. business and industry. There's a specific crime control licensing review policy related to China. The U.S. government considers applications to export or re-export most crime control items favorably on a case-by-case -case basis unless there's civil disorder in a country or the sale involves a region of concern or there's evidence that the government may have violated human rights. The purpose of these controls is to deter the development of a consistent pattern of human rights abuses, distance the uh, United States from such abuses, and avoid contributing to a disorder in a country or region. Uh, we maintain a general policy denial uh, for certain items, um, applications to export crime control items that are not subject to sanctions or comprehensive embargoes, but are identified by the Department of State as two human rights violators, receive additional scrutiny and are generally denied. Uh, there are specific controls related to legislation, uh, popularly referred to as the Tiananmen Square sanctions. And I'd like to conclude by just noting we do not receive very many applications for exports to China. We did receive uh, 25 uh, last calendar year. Uh, 21 were for the return of defective items uh, manufactured in China. They were returned to the original Chinese manufacturers. Um, there were nine denials, including applications for stun guns, optical sighting devices, pepper spray, et cetera, uh, and also voice print software, which I know was of interest. I'm happy uh, to answer any questions you may have on my testimony or uh, anything relevant to the Export Administration regulations and the controls we maintain specific to China and crime control items. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Curry.
just then. Sorry, the mic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Ruby. I, I apologize. I think you know we have the Earth Ministerial going on this week, and between that and trying to get down here from New York this morning, it was a little bit difficult. Um, but I do want to express our, our appreciation for you and the Commission holding this hearing, this very important hearing today. <laughs> I'm pleased to be able to appear before the Commission on behalf of the U.S. Mission to the United Nations and discuss our concerns regarding the, glowing, the growing human rights crisis in Xinjiang with a particular focus on how this crisis is being addressed or not at the United Nations. I'd like to submit my full remarks for the record and just give a brief summary of them. The United States is deeply troubled by the Chinese government's worsening crackdown on Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other Muslims in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Since April 2017, the Xi Jinping leadership, under the guise of fighting terrorism, secession, and religious extremism, has greatly intensified the Chinese Communist Party's longstanding repressive policies against mainstream nonviolent Muslim cultural and religious practices in Xinjiang. The stated goal of the current campaign is to sinicize religion and adapt religion to a socialist society, suggesting that Beijing believes it now possesses the political, diplomatic, and technological capabilities to transform religion and ethnicity in Chinese society in a way that its predecessors never could, even during the peak horrors of the Cultural Revolution and other heinous Maoist campaigns intended to remake Chinese society. Some, the scope of this campaign is truly breathtaking. Authorities now prohibit abnormal beards, the wearing of veils in public, and classify refusal to watch state television as a crime, refusal to wear shorts, abstention from alcohol and tobacco, refusal to eat pork, fasting during the holy month of Ramadan, practice, and practicing religional, traditional funeral rituals as potential signs that individuals harbor extreme religious views. Chinese authorities have banned parents from giving their children a number of traditional Islamic names, including Muhammad, Islam, Fatima, and Aisha, and have reportedly required children under age 16 who have Islamic names to change them. Of particular concern since 2015, Chinese authorities have increasingly criminalized or punished the teaching of Islam to young people, even by their parents adopting at least six new laws or regulations to put parents and religious leaders at legal risk if they promote nonviolent Muslim scripture, rituals, and clothing to children. Chinese authorities also continue to crack down in particular on the use of Uyghur and other minority languages at universities and in classroom instructions. As you noted, the, we now believe based on a wide array of evidence that the number of individuals detained in re-education centers for violating these strictures since April 2017 numbers in at least the hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. There are even disturbing reports that young children have been sent to state-run orphanages if only one of their parents is detained in internment camps. We call on China to end these counterproductive policies and free all those arbitrarily detained. As you noted, with many things related to China's human rights abuses, the repression does not stop at the Chinese border. The detention and persecution of Uyghur and other Muslim minorities in Xinjiang has compelled them to stop communicating with their family and friends abroad. We also are concerned by reports of Chinese authorities harassing Uyghurs abroad to, and to compel them to act as informants, return to Xinjiang, or remain silent about the situation. Chinese authorities appear to be targeting law-abiding Uyghurs, including nonviolent activists and advocates for human rights at home and abroad, as terrorist threats based solely on the basis of their political, cultural, and religious beliefs and practices. Given the disturbing and severe, severe nature of this crisis, it's worth asking why the preeminent human rights bodies of the United Nations haven't taken up this issue, exposed it, and demanded changes in China's policies. Part of the answer certainly lies in China's membership on the Human Rights Council and as a permanent member of the Security Council, as well as its ability to portray itself as a member of the Global South in the Group of 77. 
During the question and answer period, I'd be happy to give more examples of how this is working at the UN and share with you some of the particular experiences we've had at USUN, including with the attempts by the Chinese to silence Uyghur activists who wish to speak in UN forums, such as Dulkin Issa during the recent forum on indigenous people, and even shut down human rights organizations and civil society organizations that sponsor individuals, such as Mr. Issa, and their attempt to speak but I know I've run out of time, and I'll leave that to the Q&A. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk about these important issues. Thank you for making the trip down here. And I want to start with just an editorial statement and then go into a couple questions. Um, and I don't even know how to do this by still containing my anger. We're a free society. Let me just start there, in the United States. And we have, just as an example, you've just described here, what we're going to hear today is stuff from like a horrible movie. I mean, just these are crazy things. Things that we've read about that used to happen thousands of years ago or things that happen under these regimes in a science fiction novel. I mean, talking about forcing people to eat certain foods that violate their dietary laws of their religion, controlling what people name their children, trying to strip their identity from them, uh, both religious and ethnic. The list goes on. I mean, these are some of the most horrifying things that are happening in the world today. That it doesn't lead newscasts in the country and around the world in and of itself is problematic. And then in this free country that we have, as I was alluding to at the beginning, we have multinational corporations who have every right, and I do not criticize them for this, they have every right to be involved civically in our country. When things happen in America and they don't like it, they've stopped selling products, they've boycotted cities and towns, they've done all sorts of things, and it's their right to do so. These are the same companies that are up here every day in Washington, D.C., lobbying for us not to raise these issues so they can have access to China's 1.4 billion, 1.3 billion person marketplace. And I just think it's hypocritical for American corporations and multinationals doing business in China who are fully prepared to boycott American cities and American uh, communities because they don't like things that are happening here to be okay to turn a blind eye to what's happening and not criticize the government of China and the Communist Party because they don't want to jeopardize their ability to sell products in that country. It's an outrage. It's an embarrassment. And I hope, again, this is, I, don't, I doubt this is going to make it on the CBS Evening News or any of the cable news shows tonight, but this is outrageous. And it's hypocritical. And the international organizations that stand by and say nothing, why? Because China went into somebody's country and built a road or a bridge or maybe bribed them and gave them a billion dollars to be quiet and, and go along. This is just, this is sick. And I just don't understand why there isn't more coverage of this and why there isn't more understanding of who we're dealing with here and what they're up to and what they do. And the next time someone comes to me and says, well, you don't understand China, they're peaceful rise, this, that, and the other. I have no, I have no problem. I have tremendous admiration for the ancient uh, uh, culture and history of China and of its people. And I want China to be a key player in the world. We would love to have some help in dealing with all the challenges on this planet. It would be great to have another superpower to partner with. But this is what these people do with the power they have now. Imagine what they will do when that power grows militarily, economically, and geopolitically. Because if this is how you treat your own people, how do you expect them to treat people in some other part of the world? And I hope people wake up and understand what we're confronting here in the grave crisis that it presents. And that vain, Mr. Cristino, as you know, uh, Representative Smith and I wrote a letter, I have the letter here, it's dated May 9th, 2018, to Secretary Ross. We were asking for answers about the sale by U.S. companies, American companies selling surveillance and crime control technology that's being used by Chinese security forces and by their police. We specifically raised concerns about a company named Thermo Fisher Scientific, which is a company in Massachusetts which reportedly is selling DNA sequencers with advanced microprocessors to the Chinese Ministry of Public Security and its public security bureaus across China. The reply we got from Commerce noted that these DNA sequencers have a legitimate end use, which I'm sure they have a legitimate end use, but they also have an illegitimate end use. And so what other recourse do we have if we know that this material is being used in this manner, what other recourse do we have other than to restrict their sale? Despite the fact that they may have some legitimate use, theoretically there's legitimate use for any product that's sold abroad, but we don't sell these products because they are misused by the people who are buying them. Why do we continue to allow the sale of American technology to be used 
to commit these level of atrocities. Sir, I, I can point out to you that we have two types of controls uh, relative to the export administration regulations. Controls over items, such as the DNA sequencer itself, and as you correctly pointed out, due to the multiple uses of it and the fact that it's not used solely or primarily as a crime detection instrument, we do not control the sequencer itself. Uh, there are certainly numerous uses in basic science and medicine, including in China. So to try to control the export of the item to China would be problematic at best. The other type of control we have under the Export Administration regulations is a control over the activities of entities that act in a manner that's inconsistent with U.S. national security or foreign policy. Certainly, uh, human rights violations uh, are a concern with regard to U.S. foreign policy, and we do have a process related to end user review. You mentioned the public uh, security bureaus. So we do have the opportunity to review. We are reviewing as a result of the information raised to us by this commission. We are reviewing whether or not uh, the uh, evidentiary basis is there. We're relying on interagency partners to look at whether it is appropriate through the end user review committee to place these entities on the entity list. Well, just on the issue of whether or not the end user is using it this way, uh, the Department of State is seated right next to you and they've just testified publicly how this information is being used. And so I think we have an interagency process right here in this committee and I hope it's taken seriously. On the issue of the product itself, Virtually any product that's sold abroad has a legitimate use. Guns have legitimate uses, rockets, and we restrict the sale of those to certain people. We don't sell rockets, guns, tear gas, and crowd suppression to certain group because they have a history of oppressing people. Is your testimony that you don't have the statutory authority to restrict these products based on the way the law is written today? Do you need a change in the law to be able to restrict that? Or is it sort of internally a policy determination at this time that uh, it isn't wise to restrict the sale of these items because they have a broader legitimate use in China? We have appropriate authority both over items and over the activities of entities that receive U.S. items. The uh, problematic nature of this challenge is that if you were to try and control uh, DNA sequencers exported to China, you would have to be able to make a determination, rather the Bureau and the Department would need to be able to make a determination that such controls would be effective and would not adversely uh, affect a legitimate U.S. business interests in, in terms of selling these for the numerous uses in basic science or in medicine. Uh, and then you would also have to deal with uh, potential diversion con concerns over legitimate sales. So we're looking at controls not just over the DNA sequencers, but uh, over other items that may be used to determine if there is sufficient information to warrant a control over the item. But the interagency discussion, which in includes various bureaus uh, at the State Department, is at this point more focused on the entities. Well, I would just argue, I don't have a problem with restricting the entities because, but those are easy to evade. In China, the Communist Party controls anything. So wh whoever you sell it to can easily transfer it for that use. I know you don't make this decision, and therefore I'm not trying to beat up on you personally because you're here to represent the policy of the Commerce Department. But I do want to say this. It sounded like your answer was, we have to make, these companies make, have legitimate business interests and make money in China selling these DNA sequencers in the whole country, and most of the things they sell in the country are used legitimately, and we don't want to unnecessarily burden their ability to make a profit just because a small but significant percentage of their sales might be being used in this way. And if that is the direction we're going, I just find that to be unacceptable. Um, it's true. They can buy this from other countries and other companies want to sell it to them. I think for us, it comes down to the purpose of whether or not we want companies housed in the United States, benefiting from American research, from our laws, from our freedom, from the protection of our rule of law in this country, to somehow be complicit in what's happening here and in how their technology is being used. And, uh, and the fact that they're making some money in China uh, is, in my mind, not something that should counterbalance that concern. Um, again, I know you don't make the decision, but I hope the reporter back. Uh, Ambassador Curry, you're sitting here today. Um, does the State Department believe that um, 
DNA sequencers and other materials are being used in ways that we find to be gr grotesque violation of human rights. Thank you, Senator Rubio. We do believe that the security state in Xinjiang is um, excessive and is perhaps one of the most repressive in, in the world at this time. We acknowledge that the system does include thousands of security cameras, including in mosques, facial recognition software, obligatory content monitoring apps on smartphones and GPS devices in cars, widespread new police outposts, um, as you noted, and even and the embedding of party personnel in homes and the compulsory collection of vast biometric data sets on ethnic and religious minorities throughout the region, including DNA and blood samples, 3D photos, iris scans, and voice prints. We note that Human Rights Watch has documented that many of these DNA samples were collected deceptively as part of what regional officials called a health campaign. That is a report by Human Rights Watch, not the U.S. government, but it, it's in my testimony, so I believe that we must find it somewhat credible. <laughs> um, and the surveillance system has spurred security experts in, in that are experts in both general security and experts in Xinjiang to label it as one of the most intrusive security um, police states in the world. There are also grave concerns that there's an intention to migrate this system from Xinjiang out more broadly into the rest of China as this system, the grid system that's in place in Xinjiang, migrated first from Tibet into Xinjiang. It started out in Tibet and was kind of rolled out as a pilot there and then built on, scaled up in Xinjiang. Okay. My question was whether using DNA sequencers in a way that violates human rights. My take on what you just answered, and I know it's the, you need to recite the policy of the administration. <laughs> I think your answer was yes. And all I ask is that, can the State Department please tell that to the Commerce Department so that we, they... We will absolutely engage in interagency discussions with the Commerce Department about appropriate uses of technology. Yeah. And Just tell Commerce that DNA sequencers are being used to violate human rights in a grotesque way, so hopefully they can get moving on denying this. I don't care how much money Thermo, whatever their name is, Fisher, that company, Thermo Fisher Scientific. You ready? <clears throat> First of all, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Rubio, for pulling together this, this extremely important hearing. And, the, you know, the, the, what's happening in, in the, uh, against the Muslim Uyghurs, uh, we know that Rabia Qadir's entire family is incarcerated. When she got out and came here, she came and testified at one of my hearings and, and just bowled us all over about her courage, her willingness to sacrifice. At that time, at least two of her, her family were incarcerated as a hedge by the Chinese dictatorship to say, you say anything, we will hold it against them. And now it is, as we all know, as bad as it, as it was during World War II, uh, where the w Muslim Uyghurs are being discriminated against, thrown into prison, tortured, and killed uh, in a massive way. Uh, back in 2006, I chaired a hearing uh, at which I invited Google, Cisco, Microsoft, and, and Yahoo uh, about their surveillance. But in the case of Cisco, their sale of police net and other uh, uh, means by which the communist dictatorship uh, could surveil and then apprehend and then, of course, what follows then is torture uh, and long prison sentences. Uh, one of the men uh, that Yahoo um, uh, coughed up was Shi Tao, who you all recall, I know you recall it, you're shaking your head, I know you recall it well, a wonderful guy, who a journalist who contacted a New York NGO and said, this is what we're told we cannot do uh, when Tiananmen Square's anniversary comes around. And for that, he got 10 years. And who gave him that information? Yahoo. They gave personally identifiable information, uh, which then was used as actionable police state information to not only get him, but then they collect other people, or arrest them, I shouldn't say, I should say, uh, and then they interrogate them with torture, and then they call off other, of other names. Um, so we're bearing a terrible fruit of inaction for years, and as the chairman said, it's gone far beyond police net, or I'm saying that, but, but it's gone far beyond the original tools of repression uh, that, we, that a legitimate police force 
can and should use, uh, and now it's so far beyond that. I introduced a bill called the Global Online Freedom Act. One of the titles in that had to do with, just like we do with South Africa, uh, prohibiting, proscribing certain uh, police usable items that a repressive police state can use uh, to gather up re religious freedom activists, human rights activists, and in the case of the Uyghurs, because of their ethnicity and their religion, uh, the Muslim Uyghurs. Uh, I couldn't get the bill passed. The K Street lobbyists came and they descended upon the Foreign Affairs Committee. When we had the markup, I had people on the Democrat side and some on the Republican side saying that can't, and I couldn't get the bill out of committee. Now we got John Boehner, our former a speaker joining uh, in the chorus of lobbyists for a dictatorship. Uh, that, you know, if he speaks truth to power behind closed doors or and more than that, that'll be great. But if he then comes up here and just promotes the bottom line of Beijing, of Xi Jinping, who is now one of the rivals for Mao Zedong when it comes to human rights abuse, we have a problem. So again, I would I would ask you again and plead with you. We've got to make sure, like we did with, with South Africa and others in the past, make sure all of these items, and when there's a dual use capability uh, that seemingly is benign for a commercial use, but also has a political or a police application, uh, that we go all out to make sure uh, that that is on an export control regime. So if you could speak to that, because uh, I think we've been asleep at the switch. The Obama administration, now Trump, uh, during the Bush administration, uh, we could not get any traction. China has always been treated um, you know, in a way that I have found baffling. The people of China are great people. They don't have the government they deserve. They have a dictatorship that represses them. Why do we enable dictatorship by giving them these tools of repression? So if you'd like to respond to that. But this is the consequence, I think, of gross inaction over the course of many years. Please. Sir, we do control uh, quite a bit of uh, items that are used uh, in the way you described. We, we control fingerprint analyzers, automated fingerprint retrieval systems, voice print identification, along with the more traditional law enforcement uh, items normally used uh, by a, a police force. We also look very carefully at information technology items, in, uh, including uh, computer penetration and forensics tools to try to ensure that we are appropriately controlling these items and that they're not used, or I should say misused, uh, in the manner that you've described. We continue to work with our interagency partners, primarily the Department of State, uh, specifically the Bureau of uh, Human Rights and Labor, uh, the East Asia Pacific Bureau, et cetera, to ensure we're capturing the right items uh, and if we can't capture the item, that we're capturing the end use or the entities. So uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, thank you, Chairman Smith, and thank you again for hosting this, uh, for convening this important and very timely hearing today. Um, we, in, at USUN, we are focused on what we're seeing as the, the end result of the, I think, the policy approach that you outlined of um, believing that China was going to rise peacefully and was going to engage in political reform as it opened up economically, that clearly has not happened. I think that that's not a, a secret to anyone at this point, that that has not been the outcome that those who um, supported and, and advocated that policy desired. And so now we are dealing with the consequences of a China that has grown rich and powerful and is increasingly authoritarian in its behavior both at home and abroad. Um, what we're seeing, which is incredibly disturbing for us and which we are trying to find ways to combat every day at USUN, is, goes beyond what we, I think, had become accustomed to in terms of defensive strategies where China would use its position in various bodies to block criticism of it in the Human Rights Council or in other places. What we're now seeing is an effort by China to actually try to transform the entire normative framework of human rights. And when I say that, what I'm talking about is substituting what we all think of as the normative framework of human rights, of uh, uh, rights that attach at the individual level, basic God-given human rights in the parlance of American um, way of thinking about this, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of thought, freedom of association, to transform the whole human rights system into 
what the Chinese characterize as one based on win-win cooperation or mutually beneficial cooperation between states, and a system that prioritizes the concerns of governments rather than prioritizing their responsibility to respect the human rights of their citizens. And what we're seeing at the UN, both in New York and across the UN system, is deeply concerning in this regard. The Chinese are using all the tools of state power, all of their um, capabilities, to try to undermine the normative framework of human rights. And they're doing it in a way that is both blatant as well as under the, under, the, um, under the radar. So we are fighting back against it whenever we can. We are trying to get the, block them from putting this, the language of win-win and mutually beneficial cooperation into resolutions at the UN, which they are doing across the board. We're trying to block them from using the development system of the UN to undermine efforts to promote good governance, anti-corruption, and human rights as part of the package of responsible development behavior, um, something that they are doing through um, a, a variety of means. And we are also fighting to make sure that voices of civil society can be heard at the UN, including people like D Uyghur activist Dolkin Issa, who, what, who the Chinese have tried to block from participating in UN fora. So at USUN, we are, I think, very cognizant of the threat that the situation poses and are working very hard on a daily basis. Our biggest challenge right now is that we are relatively alone in this. And in a situation where you've got 193 member states, many of whom can be persuaded by some of the tools that Senator Rubio mentioned about the Belt and Road Initiative, about the amount, about the kind of relationships that the Chinese are building across the developing world in particular, but not just in the developing world. We are, we are really struggling to gain traction um, in terms of getting other member states to join us in this effort to push back on even as things as simple as the, the debt that the Chinese system is, 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 is building, the unsustainable debt levels in development that the Chinese are creating with developing countries. So it, it is a massive struggle. This administration takes it very seriously. Um, and everything from where you heard the White House push back um, on the Chinese political correctness with trying to force U.S. businesses to change their websites on Taiwan to what we are doing every day at USUN. We are taking these threats seriously. We are looking for every opportunity to try to push back on them. And we are, are very serious about standing up for the human rights of the Chinese people, in particular calling more attention to the situation in Xinjiang because it is deeply underreported, as Senator Rubio noted. Earlier. I'll be very brief because I know my time is running out or has run out. Ambassador Curry, thank you for your leadership. And Nikki Haley, please convey to her that we do, I, I stand in great respect, I think we all do, in awe of the work that she has done. She is often a lone voice as our, our delegation, and you have been tenacious. Um, you know, the, the redefinition of human rights is exactly what the Soviet Union tried to do in the 80s and 90s. Um, they used to say, oh, look, America, you have a terrible problem of homelessness, therefore we have a better situation than you do because nobody's on the street. Yeah, they're all in the gulag or at the psychiatric hospital. Uh, but, but that said, um, we, we address our humanitarian needs, but as you pointed out, they're not fundamental human rights and they are seeking redefinition. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I held a series of hearings in my subcommittee on the influence, it's the Africa Global Health, Global Human Rights Committee, of Chinese soft power particularly this indebtedness issue, which is putting the African countries in huge debt and owings where even more power can be exerted by the Chinese. And then they call on those chits in the UN to do just what you're finding in us standing alone on this. So, but hopefully for the Uyghurs and for the, you know, the people suffering in the autonomous region, um, uh, they will join us on that. They're even trying to influence Europe uh, amazingly and they're having an impact. So thank you for your leadership. Sorry, King. Well, first, I want to thank both Chairman Smith and Chairman Rubio for their passion and attention to this issue. It's, uh, it's troubling, to say the least. The first thing I would do, uh, Mr. Chairman, is uh, suggest that I'd like to submit for the record a, uh, a long story that appeared in The Economist on May 31st that outlines this 
problem. I think this is a, a dramatic statement of exactly what we're talking about uh, and the horror of it. As I read it, all I could think of was my youthful reading of, of 1984 and Brave New World. Uh, its technology turned on its head to enslave people instead of liberate them. Uh, I was also recently reading about the period of the 1930s and the uh, reluctance of America principally but other, other countries uh, to recognize what was going on in Germany. Uh, there was an almost deliberate blind eye turn to uh, what was being done and of course it wasn't until a decade later that we realized the full horror of the Holocaust. I've often thought of the difficulty that that, ish, that question presents. What if we had known in detail, specifically in the 30s, what was going on in Germany? What then would our obligations have been? Uh, it seems to me that we're at a similar moment, only we have more information. We know what's going on. Uh, we don't know the exact details, but we know about re-education camps. We know about, as the chairman recited, people being forced to change their names, uh, violate religious practices, uh, a, a modern-day apartheid. Uh, we do know about it. So what do we do? And, Ambassador, I, I appreciate your coming, number one, and I appreciate the statements that you've made, but it seems to me that what we really need is a – it's not as if we have no relations with China. We have detailed inter interconnections, trade, uh, culture, uh, m many exchanges, uh, uh, ambassadors, the whole deal. What can we do? What are the levers that we have? Because I don't want somebody reading the history of this period and looking back 30 years from now or 50 years from now and saying, America tolerated a Holocaust uh, or something similar. Uh, what, what, what are the levers of power that we have that we can exert in this situation uh, in order to try to bring the, the, this country, this wonderful country, to its senses in terms of what they're doing to these people? Ambassador, give me a, give me a laundry list. I wish I had a laundry list. Right now, what we can do at USUN is help to shine a light on the situation. I think that the the severity, the scope, and the magnitude of the situation has really only become clear, I would say, in the past few months. We had been hearing stories more or less sporadically that this was happening, but some of the research that Senator Rubio cited, the looking at the tender offers and understanding, being able to map those things, and then as the stories, I mean, the Chinese have done an excellent job of keeping, of attempting to keep this under wraps, of not allowing reporting to go into Xinjiang and actually report directly on what is happening, including our diplomats. Um, and so it has been a very it's been a serious challenge to really get a handle on the scope and severity of this. So um, I'm not saying that as an excuse just to, to kind of that we are just now really starting to, to understand the scope of it. And so we are starting to shine a light on it and looking for more opportunities to do that. And, and this hearing is an important one today. But I, I think developing a laundry list is important. And we are and we have the tools that we use. The, the tools are the tools in the human rights world. They they exist. Exist. They, it, it's, it's always a matter of political will for us about where we choose to use them. I think today's um, ministerial on international religious freedom, where this topic will be discussed, it was mentioned in Secretary Pompeo's op-ed yesterday. It was mentioned, and it will be, you know, mentioned this week during the ministerial. And I think that for us. Part of it is, at this point, educating, frankly speaking, a, a number of countries that are not as aware as we are at this point of what is going on. Because when I, I, I raise it with colleagues at the UN, many of my colleagues, including in the Muslim world, have no idea this is even I happening. I think that's an important point, because if there's anything we've learned in the last 20 years about sanctions, for example, they're much more effective if they're multilateral much more effective, and, and I think a very important point is to talk to the rest of the world and, and say, it's nice that they're offering to build you a bridge, but understand that it comes with a price, and the price may be paid by innocent people in this, in this province of China. So I, I think 
that's an important part. But I hope that you will, uh, uh, that the administration will develop a, a set of options, policy options, uh, that can uh, uh, begin to uh, not only express disapproval or shine a light on the problem, but uh, really have some direct uh, impact, uh, because this doesn't uh, reflect well on the, on the Chinese people. Uh, it it, it uh, mars uh, what would otherwise be uh, uh, something that might be might be positive in terms of assisting undeveloped parts of the world, but if it's done at the price of having to tolerate this, it's it's certainly not in the, in the interests of the people of China or the people of the world. Mr. Chris, uh, Cristino, uh, I think if anything has come through, I hope this morning that we feel very strongly that. To the extent of your authority, we've really got to have a renewed attention to uh, the export of, of technology that is being used uh, to develop what appears now to be the world's most advanced police state. I mean, the idea of having people that move in, that adopt a family, uh, uh, police stations uh, 200 meters apart, uh, I mean, it, 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 thousands and if not millions of surveillance cameras, iris scans, blood samples taken uh, under false pretenses. I mean, this is, this is really the stuff of science fiction and, and uh, har horrible science fiction at that. So I, 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 I don't want it to be business as usual at your office. This is a new challenge, as the ambassador said. It's come into focus in the last several months, the last year. So I hope your office will renew its attention to this and uh, be much more uh, uh, alert uh, to uh, the p potential use of this technology. And my view is, even if there is a legitimate use for it, if it can be used for this purpose, it should be under additional scrutiny, if not outright uh, uh, sanction uh, by, your, by your office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. Senator Cotton. Uh, I'll, I'll just continue where Senator King left off. I mean, even if there is a legitimate use to it, why would we sell it to China? Why would we authorize it to be sold to China? I mean, they're not France, not Sweden. Um, so I don't think we should sell it to China regardless, even if there is a legitimate use. And if the administration can't do that with it existing authorities, then perhaps Congress should explore giving you more authorities to do so. I mean, Mr. Cristino, I know you have a lot of experience in, in this field. Did we sell crowd control and policing equipment and technology to the Soviet Union when it existed? No, sir. So why would we sell it to China now, since China is our number one geopolitical rival going forward in the coming decades, and they're plainly using this kind of technology in Xinjiang uh, to oppress their own people and to build their national power in a way to challenge us. I mean, one of the reasons why China has been able to turn it, its focus outward onto the Blue Seas and challenge us inside the first island chain and in the South China Sea is that they've gained greater control of their internal borders, especially in Xinjiang and Tibet. And, and I turn now Ambassador Kerr, to you, and something you said earlier, I want to just explore a little bit further and ask if you could elaborate. You said, talk about the concept of a pilot program. You know, some of these some of these techniques first piloted in Tibet. Now they've been rolled out on greater and more advanced scale in Xinjiang, potentially going to the rest of China. Could you elaborate, please, on that? Certainly, Senator Cotton. I think um, our understanding is that after the 2008 events in Lhasa and the protests that took place then across the Tibetan plateau, the Chinese um, authorities came in with a much more aggressive approach to policing and social control in Tibet. And they began both um, with policing with the close, the, the, the closely spaced police stations, the intense surveillance, and the control over religious institutions and cultural institutions, the massive political education, the pressure on state employees from teachers to um, policemen to doctors of Tibetan extraction who were forced to take political education classes, um, much more intensive management of monasteries in Tibet, um, and then this as as tech they they fused that approach that um what what we might call community based policing if it were being done for a proper purpose but which in this case is really just community based oppression um they fused that with a, a technological edge 
in in Xinjiang and it's and doubled down on it and have added some very particular aspects to it in terms of the restrictions um, the the legal restrictions that they've passed into into regulations and have made more of a um, put put it under law which is something that the Chinese like to do to kind of create a thin veneer of legality over their their the, the forms of oppression that they're using against these minority communities. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I suspect that, that is what's going to happen. That it'll be rolled out expansively throughout the country. And also another issue that was touched upon briefly earlier, um, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, you know, pretty tall mountains down there in Tibet, hard to get a road through there. So the road in the Belt and Road Initiative presumably is going primarily through Xinjiang province into Central Asia and then perhaps all the way in into Europe. Um, how closely connected is the oppression that we see in Xinjiang province to that Belt and Road Initiative, which of course is a direct challenge to the United States' position as the world's leading economy and the global military superpower? Security along the Belt and Road is a major human rights challenge, um, not just in inside China's borders, but across it. Um, but they definitely are insistent on having a high degree of security through key corridors, and Xinjiang is one of those key corridors. Um, part of it, it's not, it goes beyond also the repression directed at mm. the Muslim minority communities in, Xang, in Xinjiang. And this, what we're seeing in addition to the, the repression directed at those communities is the continued incentivization of in-migration and other activities to encourage the growth of the non-Uyghur, uh, non-Kazakh, non-Muslim population in By in-migration, I mean, to call a spade a spade, you mean essentially colonization, right? That is, um, it, it could the, the be The data I have here in front of me says that uh, in 1949, Xinjiang had 7% Han Chinese. Today, it's up to 40%. Some experts have characterized it as colonization, yes. Um, what, what we've seen there is, is also that the, the Chinese residents of Xinjiang tend to dominate the businesses. They get the state contracts, and they are involved in the actual infrastructure development that is linked to the Belt and Road. And again, to call a spade a spade, the, the Chinese that are dominating the businesses, they're dominating the businesses because the Chinese Communist Party is empowering them to have those businesses and disempowering all the native-born Muslim Uyghurs or Kazakhs or other minorities in Xinjiang. Yes. Uh, one final question. Um, we talked about earlier about you know the, the loss of uh, on a market for American companies and things like crowd control or policing technique or more cutting edge technology that can be used for those things like DNA mapping, facial recognition technology. One common argument you hear <coughs> from American companies is, well, if we don't sell it to them, someone's going to sell it to them, right? Remind, reminds me of the old line that a, a communist's definition of a capitalist is a man who will sell us the rope with which we hang him. But I just want to ask you, who are the, who are the countries whose companies could pick up that business? And maybe, Mr. Cristino, this is better directed at you as well. If we stop selling this kind of technology to China, in which countries around the world are the companies located that would pick up that business from American companies? Well, sir, with regard specifically to the DNA sequencers that were mentioned prominently earlier during the hearing, uh, they're made essentially all over the world. It's relatively simple technology. It's not very cutting edge technology. It's been around for at least 30 years. Uh, some of the main manufacturers are actually in China itself. And you don't even need the, uh, the item, the sequencer. In, in, in many cases, as we uh, see on TV all the time, there's a great deal of advertising for DNA analysis. It's simply a swab and send. Uh, so. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity for the Chinese security services to continue to do what they're doing without U.S. items. Mr. Curry, did you have a response to that one? Um, I, I would I would agree with um, with my colleague that the the Chinese not just in this <clears throat> not just in this this area of technology, but they as part of the um, Made in China 2025 drive and 2050 drive, they've definitely um, 
the goal there is to make China technologically self-sufficient so that even if we do put export controls on all manner of things, then they would be able to produce them domestically without having to rely on external sources for items such as this. Okay. Thank you both. I have just uh, two quick comments and a quick question, and I know uh, Congressman Smith does as well before we turn to our panel. We want to thank you both for being here. Your answer to Senator Cotton's last question almost sounds like um, they're going to do it anyway, so we might as well make some, allow our companies to make some money on it. And, and I'm not saying that's what your intention is in representing it that way, but that's sort of the logical conclusion of it is this, this technology is widely available. They're gonna, this is not going to be able to stop them from doing it. And what I hope you'll take back to commerce is I don't believe that any of us who are calling for this technology like the DNA sequencer being prohibited believe that doing so will prohibit them or stop them from doing this. We just don't want American companies to be participants in it. And, and I think that's the, the bigger point for us as a nation. They're, they're, you can buy crowd control equipment. China will sell you crowd control equipment. They will sell you anything. They don't care about human rights record, democracy, anything like that. If you have the cash, they'll sell it to you. Uh, that doesn't mean that we go. We still deny the sale of certain equipment. And it, it brings to light another point, and that is, you know, our laws have to keep pace with our technology. What is used to control crowds today is different from what it might have been 10, 15, 20 years ago, and that includes technological advances to that point. Um, did you want to add something on that point? Well, I just wanted to point out that this is exactly the argument that was made in Britain to justify the sale of Rolls-Royce engines to the Luftwaffe in 1935. It's a, it was a bad argument then, and it's a bad argument there now because the issue you're talking about is complicity. I don't want to be complicit in this. Yeah, agreed. And, and talking about the, the other thing that I think this brings to light is if you read through the regs uh, uh, and how it describes sort of crowd control and suppression, it's all 20th century technology, and it's still used. But in the 21st century, technology increasingly play, plays a role. I'll give you one example, uh, the use of uh, intense security measures to surveillance technology. Um, we know, for example, that uh, the Chinese are now using, in this particular region in, in, in specific, facial recognition cameras in neighborhoods, on roads and train stations. It appears focused on using much of the surveillance and data collected to monitor and, to, and repress Uyghurs. In fact, the authorities reportedly integrate a lot of this surveillance, so they're taking data uh, from all, all sorts of things, you know, the computers, smartphones, closed circuit cameras, license plates, ID cards, individual family planning and banking records, information on their international travel. They're taking all of this information and they're running it through something that's called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform and they're using that data, all of that data, to identify people that they think should be subject to investigation and potential detention. In essence, how they're defining who to put in these camps is the process of an algorithm that's looking at all of this data they're collecting on people and deciding from it um, who they should be detaining. And here's why I point that out. A key component of that in the 21st century is going to be artificial intelligence. The ability to learn from the gathering of data the way a human would and improve it each and every time. And I raise that only because there's a tremendous irony in this room here today. That picture that we have of a camp and how it grew comes from Google Earth. Okay? Google recently dropped out of a contract with the Department of Defense on Project Maven artificial intelligence because its employees do not want to be involved with the American government and the DOD working on the use of artificial intelligence to potentially harm people. At the same time, Google has opened up an AI China Center. And basically anything you do in China that's technological, if you think you're going to constrain it to just the pr private sector, you're crazy. All of it will be shared with the military and with the repressive forces that are doing this. And Google has no excuse. They know that this is happening because they've got pictures of it. That's Google Earth. So that's just one more example of the hypocrisy of an American company that knows this is happening, doesn't want to give AI technology to the military because, God forbid, we may use it one day to target a terrorist or, or someone who wants to harm America, but has no problem opening up a center of AI in China, knowing full well that how China, anything that you do in China if it's a benefit to the military, uh -huh. they're going uh -huh. to use it. If it's a benefit to their security services, they're going to use it. And my last question, this is a question. We've raised the issue of global Magnitsky sanctions. The purpose of global Magnitsky sanctions were to be able to identify individuals doing horrible things and be able to impose sanctions upon them. We clearly know horrible things are happening here. 
uh, to the Uyghurs in, 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 their, in their area. And we know that they're individuals that are at least making the decision and most certainly individuals that are applying those uh, decisions. <coughs> what is happening within state now? Is there consideration being made? Is there deliberation? Is there talk? What are the chances of being able to apply global Magnitsky sanctions to individuals that we know are in charge of these regions and at the highest levels have to be held responsible for what's happening? Um, well, as you know, Global Magnitsky is a rolling um, determination data set where we are constantly looking at individuals who are involved with uh, either serious corruption issues or gross human rights abuses. And the, it's an interagency process. It is not the State Department alone that manages that process. In fact, the final determination and the final um, check on that is actually with the Treasury Department. But it is an interagency process, and the State Department does play an important role in identifying targets and helping to move them through the process, build the data packages around Global Magnitsky. Um, I cannot speak to specific individuals that may be uh, being chosen or being looked at for sanctions, but what I can say is that we do see the Global Magnetsky sanctions as an important tool to help identify abusers and, and bring them in, and use the, the ability of the United States to sanction those individuals, limit their access to the U.S. financial system, and block them from being able to, and, and in some cases, even seize assets that they may have in the U.S. financial system. If there are suggestions that the Commission has for individuals that the Department should be looking at, I would encourage you to forward those to the Bureau of D Human Rights and Labor, Dem um, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, DRL, because they generally start the process rolling with um, with determinations and I'd be happy to take anything back that you have well you can count on we most certainly have ideas about individuals and it's probably not a complete list we're, we're open to adding more people as this continues um, if ever my, my only takeaway is as you go back and however the, this forum reaches the decision makers in the interagency to the extent that the Department of State is involved in the interagency we, we just I, at least me personally, I, I can't speak for everyone else, but I think there'd be a consensus on the commission and throughout, across Congress that if ever there was a model case for how we intended Global Magnitsky to be used as a tool, this would be it. Because there is more cl there's most clearly abuses happening. Wherever there's abuses, there are abusers. And in the case of China, those abusers, if they're high enough in government, are almost guaranteed to not just have U.S. visas, but either them or their families have some access to either the U.S. financial system, our universities, or enjoying, uh, that's just the way it works for high-ranking individuals. They like to travel the world and they like to spend money in the U.S. And uh, so if ever there was an example of, of where Magnitsky could be powerful in making a statement about where we stand on this issue, we believe this is one of them and we will most certainly continue to push for it and offer suggestions about individuals. Congressman Smith, you had the final question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> just let me add my a uh, strong endorsement of what you just said about Global Magnitsky. You know, I'm the author of the Belarus Democracy Act of 2004. Great pushback when we did it. Lukashenko, the dictator in Belarus, was sanctioned along with about 200 other people. Uh, I went there twice, went to Minsk. First time he called me public enemy number one. But one by one, every political prisoner got out of prison. And it applied not just to him, but to his family and to other families of his, his group uh, that were committing gross human rights violations. Uh, so it does work. The Global Magnitsky Act and the Magnitsky Act itself, targeted towards Russia, is an, a, a tool of surpassing capabilities. Uh, I hope we would do a data call uh, to our embassy in Beijing, uh, to our ambassador, uh, Branstad, uh, and say, give us the names. It's got to really come. If they're not going to initiate it, they probably won't. Uh, it'll come from Washington, I would hope, and say, who is responsible for this horrific uh, carnage being imposed upon the Muslim Uyghurs? Rabia Qadir, who is here, uh, her courage is, I mean, she should, should win the Nobel Peace Prize for her courage. Matter of fact, in the past, um, many of us have asked that that happen, um, and it should be present as well. I can't tell you how concerned all of us are. We've got six Radio Free Asia uh, um, uh, families who are missing or, or incarcerated as part of this massive 
World War II type roundup. This is this is now you know similar to what the what the uh, uh, the, uh, the Nazis did in terms of the mess of, this, uh, of, of, of gathering people uh, for, for torture and the like. So the Magnitsky Act is just sitting there like low-hanging fruit, tools that absolutely have to be deployed uh, and make up a list. Like I said, um, the second time I met with uh, Lukashenko, you know, he was all sweetness and light. He's still a dictator. Uh, but all the political prisoners have been released to the best of our knowledge. On another issue related, in 2000, I wrote the Admiral Nance Meg Donovan uh, Foreign Relations Act. One of the provisions we put in there said that anyone who was complicit with forced abortion or forced sterilization, which during the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal was properly construed to be a crime against humanity for its Nazi usage against uh, Poles and others, um, it, it is just as much of a crime against humanity today. We know that China itself is missing 62 million uh, women, girls, who have been eviscerated from their population by sex selection abortion. We know that it's been used as a genocidal tool against the Tibetans and against the Uyghurs. Nobody ever seems to talk about it except the chairman and I, and perhaps a small number of others. Uh, it's like you know, the topic you don't bring up because the choice community will looks askance on this. Uh, these women are being horribly and forcibly aborted. Sometimes they bring, uh, and it's being used as a, as a tool of genocide to eliminate uh, the Muslim Uyghurs in that country. You have an additional tool sitting there since 2000. It was not used by the Obama administration. I brought it up over and over again in the hearings. I said, you may disagree with me on the right to life and the fact that unborn children ought to be protected from the violence of abortion. But here we're talking about forced abortion. Can we not even have agreement there to try to protect people from this violence uh, that is being imposed upon them? So you have another tool I would ask you to revisit, uh, especially as it relates, including as it relates uh, to the Muslim Uyghurs, because they are using it. I intervened on one case brought to us by some good friends of a woman who had been uh, brought in with about 25 to 30 uh, cadres, family planning cadres, police escorts, to have her Muslim child uh, aborted. I talked to the ambassador here to China, talked to our ambassador, our US ambassador, and that one child uh, got a reprieve and was saved, but one among millions who are being slaughtered. So please look at the Admiral Nance McDonovan provision uh, to see if that could be uh, brought out and used, get the dust off of it, because uh, I think it'll make a difference. And again, like the chairman said, the Magnitsky Act, you get a list of couple of hundred start off with names, and then they can't come here. They can't send their kids to NYU, which has a, you know, I, I spoke at NYU a couple of years ago on human rights uh, in Shanghai. Uh, let's, let's let, you know, let's get it all out there. Okay, you're done. <laughs> your families don't come here because of your egregious violations of human rights. So I, I, please, Magnitsky, this is a, a textbook case of where it should be utilized. And I implore you, and again, the chairman, I thank you for, for, again, pulling together this extremely important hearing. And again, I do thank you, Ambassador, both of you, for your leadership. Uh, at the UN, you've been extraordinary, despite what the Human Rights Council does, which unfortunately uh, majors in hypocrisy, uh, focuses on Israel to the exclusion of the real human rights abuses. Uh, and, and Nikki Haley has called that out so, so courageously, and we thank her for that. Bye. Thank you. And we have a, a second panel we want to get to as quickly as possible because I know uh, Senator King uh, needs to go. I know Congressman Smith has votes, but Senator Daines is here. And I know I had a few questions for this panel before we turn it over. If our next panelists start getting ready because we're going to jump into it pretty quick. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rubio and Chairman Smith. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses for coming here today. Uh, I spent uh, more than half a a decade in China in the private sector. In fact, uh, had two children born in Hong Kong, uh, lived in Guangzhou. Uh, I've led congressional visits to China uh, every year since I've been in the United States Senate. I've had the opportunity to travel across the country. I've uh, been in Xinjiang. I've been in Urumqi as well. I've seen the prominent Uyghur Muslim populations. Uh, I've been in Tibet, seen the Buddhist monks. Just recently was in Dandong along the North Korean border. This has allowed me to see firsthand uh, the pervasive censorship and the challenges the Chinese people face, as well as the efforts made by the Chinese government to extend their influence beyond their border. 
As your testimonies uh, suggest, the State Hum Department Human Rights Report and numerous others indicate the situation in Xinjiang is dire for its Uyghur population. Whether it's pervasive surveillance, uh, the destruction of thousands of mosques, or the detention of hundreds of thousands in so-called re-education camps, as well as indefinite detentions, it's critically important that we as a nation founded on freedom and the rule of law bring our influence to bear to advance human rights in China and around the world. Ambassador Curry, what do you see as China's end game as it relates to the persecution and the repression of its Uyghur population? Is this cultural, economic, religious, or some other combination? Thank you for that question. Um, we would say that it's all of those things. It is a combination of, of those elements um, with an additional aspect of political control. Um, what we see is an effort to sinicize religion and to bring the, the Chinese Communist Party needs to control, feels a need to control anything that is, that is not under its immediate control. And so it does put a lot of constraints on all religious activity in China. And because of the global nature in particular of Islam and Christianity as well, um, those two religions tend to come in for particular scrutiny and particular suspicion from the um, uh, authorities and for a much more coercive and much more restrictive approach. Um, so we, I, I believe that in, this, in Xinjiang and when, in the case of the Uyghur population in particular, there is an absolute, the State Department sees a, an effort to sinicize religion and to bring the practices of Uyghur Muslims into line with a level of religiosity that the party finds acceptable. And bearing in mind that the party is itself an atheist entity, we can, we can surmise that that is a very low level of religiosity and one that is very limited in terms of being um, limited in terms of its international relations and, and connections outside of China. Ambassador Curry, are there any particular tools or technologies that would be helpful for the U.S. government or NGO to support to assist those persecuted populations? The, the tools that the United States is using in terms of Radio Free Asia and the Voice of America, getting the truth into people, giving um, and then making sure that we are also reporting on the situation on the ground are particularly important. Information is, is obviously critical here. Our ability to understand what is going on in Xinjiang is limited by the efforts of the Chinese government to, to cover up and mask what they're doing. And so the more that we can use information technology both to inform our own population and our allies and other countries about what's happening, as well as to make the people of China aware of what is happening in other parts of the country, and as well as um, the concerns that are taking place outside of China regarding the treatment of ethnic minorities, and that these are these, these practices are not consistent with respect for international human rights. I, I believe that those are the things that the U.S. government can use to try to, to address the problem in terms of technology. Um, beyond that, I think that we are, it's really just a lot of it is about old-fashioned di diplomacy and doing, doing our jobs better of, of making, of educating our our colleagues at the UN, for instance, about the scope of what's going on, and just trying to to work work with and, and grow the coalition of countries that are concerned around this issue. Yeah, I remain very concerned. Just since my visits out into Western China a couple of years ago, the thousands of mosques that have been demolished, and whether it's the Muslim people, Christian people, the level of persecution by all accounts, all reports we're receiving here is reaching levels that is virtually unprecedented here in, in, in modern history in China. It's extending here to the United States, hearing reports from Chinese students who are being called by professors uh, back in China saying, do not associate and go to faith-based activities. Uh, this is something we haven't seen, and um, I remain very, very concerned. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Ambassador Curry, thank you for making the trip. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cristino, as well. We appreciate it. Uh, we are grateful. This was very insightful. Thank you. And uh, our next panel will come forward. And as you guys get positioned, um, we're, members will fluctuate in and out. The Congressman Smith had to leave. The House has votes. Members here have meetings and different activities. We certainly don't want to curtail your testimony. It's important to hear your stories. Know that your full testimony is going to be in the record. Uh, we're probably going to have a hard stop in this meeting in, in, at 12.10, 12.15. So we, it, the less, uh, the shorter you can get those statements, the, the more time we can have to engage with you on some details that I think will be in, enlightening for the commission and for our record. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here. Ms. Hoja, let's be, we'll begin with you and your testimony. Thank you for being here. We're, we've, I've read your full statement. It's very uh, compelling. We want to hear more from you today and look forward to engaging with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, and the members of the Commission. It's my privilege to participate in today's hearing on a topic that deeply affects me personally and professionally. My name is Gülçehra Hoca. I am a journalist with Radio Free Asia's Uyghur Language Service, and I am a, U I am a US citizen. Given the time, uh, I will not read my full statement, but uh, share my story. I grew up in Urumqi, the capital of Uyghur region in China, where I began my career in broadcast journalism before coming to United States in 2001 to work for Radio Free Asia. It was a great sacrifice to leave my homeland. I left behind a successful career as a television journalist. I also left my home my parents, my family, and my friends. But coming here guaranteed me freedom, something that could never be realized in China. Being part of Radio Free Asia, which reports on the true daily news happening in the Uyghur region, was the dream of a lifetime. As I testify before you today, it grieves me to no end to say that my parents remained under threat. And more than two dozen of my relatives in China are missing. Almost certainly held in called re-education camps run by Chinese government. I first heard my brother Kaisar Qiyum was detained at the end of September last year. Police had taken him when he was driving my mother to doctor's appointment, leaving her alone in the car without any explanation. She waited for her son, who would never return. Kaiser was being held in one of the so-called re-education centers in Urumqi. We have not seen him since. In February, my parents, both elderly, and suffering from life-threatening ailments went missing. Not being able to talk to my mother and father or to learn how they were doing was almost too much to bear. I tried contacting other family, but could not reach them. And I learned in February that my aunts, cousins, their children, more than 20 people had been swept up by authorities in the same day. No one has confirmed where they are being held, but I strongly suspect they are in the camps, which sources say hold over more than like 
one million Uyghurs in the extremely poor conditions. My parents were held in medical facility in the detention camps, and they were allowed to live in March. Maybe because of their poor health, authorities has questioned my parents about me, where I am, and my work for an organization they claim is anti-China. Many of my Uyghur colleagues at the RFA share the same situation. Their families are also missing, detained, and jailed after receiving threats about their work at RFA. I hope and pray for my family to be let go and released. But I know, even if that happens, they will still live under constant threat. Despite these threats, I know, and my colleagues know, that we must continue because of the important role we have as a source of truth for the Uyghur people. I came to United States to realize a dream, a dream of a being able to tell the truth without fear. It may be difficult, but I will keep trying and I will never give up. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Professor Thumb. Um, Thank you to the chairs and to the committee for organizing this in in incredibly important hearing. Um, I'd like to submit my written testimony to the record and just emphasize a few interpretive points here um, because we have a lot of the data on the table already. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that this, this is an emergency that is developing as we speak. Those numbers of several hundred thousand to over a million Uyghurs five to 10% of the Uyghur population um, disappearing into these internment camps are based on estimates from January, uh, data that came out in January over about what happened in the previous year. We've had another six months. People have continued to disappear and very few people, usually sick people, have been um, released. We see new camps being built in the satellite imagery and we have new advertisements from the Xinjiang authorities asking for construction companies to build additional camps. The last one to appear is about a 400,000 square foot facility that will probably come online sometime between September and December. This enormous and growing scale is important, not just in an absolute sense, where we have the feeling that, well, maybe if it crosses a big enough number, the world will care but also as a proportion of the number of community members who disappear. This is something you can see on the streets in southern Xinjiang, uh, in the closed buildings, the closed shops, the closed houses of people who've disappeared. You can see it in one county in Kashgar where 18 orphanages have been built, according to a Financial Times report, in the last year alone to house the children of those who have been sent to the detention camps. My uh, second point I want to make is about the goals of these camps, which is something that was asked about earlier. Uh, these camps serve multiple goals. They serve the explicit goal of, uh, which many Chinese officials seem to really believe in, of changing the way people think through force, of purifying them of supposedly bad ideas and inculcating a love for the party and for Xi Jinping. They also serve to remove uh, certain demographics from the population, especially 20 to 40 year olds, which police have explicitly targeted. Um, and of course they serve as the background disciplinary threat that upholds the totalitarian micromanagement of Uyghurs everyday activities and cultural expressions. But the frightening thing is that what we know from history is that when you get large detention systems that op are operating in legal gray zones, or in this case, perhaps even an entirely extra legal zone, there is a lot of room for improvisation on the part of those who are running those camps. So the, the frightening purpose, the most frightening purpose, is the one that, that, that hasn't occurred yet. And while right now torture and deaths in the camps seem to be happening at pretty low levels, 
um, that can change. And in fact, I don't think we can rule out the possibility of mass, uh, mass murder. The third point I want to make, and I'll do it briefly, is that the camps are not the only problem, although I've emphasized it here because they're easy to summarize. If you take them out of the picture, we're still looking at one of the most oppressive police states in the world uh, with, uh, as uh, Senator Rubio mentioned, um, a, race, a, a system of, of racism very similar to apartheid. My last major point I want to make is about the deeper causes of this. This is a colonial uh, settler operation. And it is, um, contrary to some opinions, not explicitly about religion per se. The Chinese Communist Party, despite being avowedly atheist, has a great deal of tolerance for what they see as Chinese religions being practiced by ethnic Chinese. When it comes to a foreign religion or a religion seen as Chinese, like Buddhism, practiced by non-Chinese, like Tibetans, that story changes. And it becomes even more intense when it's Islam, because the Chinese Communist Party over the last 20 years or so has adopted American and European discourses of Islamophobia, which they picked up largely through cooperation with the US global war on terror. Um, because of that, this is a deeply entrenched worldview of Chinese officials behind this. And I don't think, for that reason, that we can convince Chinese officials to change their path based on data about how it will improve the internal situation. I think, instead, we need, they think this is working. So we need to make this not a domestic issue, but a global issue. Uh, and I see that I'm out of my time, so I will end there. Thank you. Ms. Becky. Chairman Rubio, Chairman Smith, and distinguished members of the commission, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm here in a personal capacity, so I'm only representing myself. Others have very ably already discussed what's happening in Xinjiang, so I won't use my time on that. Instead, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about terminology. I believe that if we are to treat what is happening in Xinjiang with the seriousness and alarm that it merits, we first need to accurately label what it is we are witnessing. So official Chinese sources refer to these as transformation through education centers or counter-extremism centers. And outside China, they're fre frequently called re-education camps. But from what we've heard today, we know these are somewhat euphemistic characterizations, and they do not clearly and precisely define what it is we are witnessing. Some observers have called these concentration camps based on a definition of this, the state for the reasons of state security, targeting in particular ethnic and religious minorities and confining them into um, sp certain spaces. Other peoples have wondered whether these camps, because they're interning uh, religious and ethnic minorities, could presage something much worse, like ethnic cleansing. And while I'm not an expert in international law, and I don't feel I have standing to offer the legal term of art, which most accurately defines what we're seeing, I think uh, the US government and the international community in general needs to think very hard about what's happening in these camps and what we should call them, and whether they are an early warning sign of something much worse to come. Turning to the Chinese leadership. Uh, despite a general lack of uh, insight into Chinese leadership politics, Xinjiang Party Secretary Chen Chuanguo's role in this is unusually clear. His tenure coincides not only with the large-scale use of these camps, but as you noted, uh, with the building of uh, thousands of convenience police stations, with a ma massive increase in security personnel hiring and overall security spending, and as we know now, a uh, massive increase in arrests as well. And this pattern of securitization, as was previously mentioned, echoes very clearly Chen Chuanguo's security policies in another ethnic minority region in China, Tibet, when he was party secretary there from 2011 to 2016. But though Chen has been directly responsible for overseeing these policies, neither Chen nor the policies themselves are sui generis. They clearly fit into a larger policy trend of criminalization of ethnic and religious identity, and that traces from central level guidance, at least from 2014, if not earlier, down through regular regional regulations and local implementation. So what is the impact beyond Xinjiang? Domestically, surveillance capabilities and restrictive measures could be employed, and, and indeed, by some accounts, they already are being employed against other ethnic or religious minorities in China. Internationally, as we've discussed, Uyghurs in exile are not only surveilled, but they can be coerced into reporting on fellow Uyghurs um, that to Chinese state security authorities. 
Other governments have assisted China in forcibly repatriating ethnic minorities back to Xinjiang. And finally, there's the issue of Chinese government pressure, even indirectly, um, often encouraging self-censorship among those of us who are here working and writing on China. So I'm going to make a few policy recommendations. It is a mistake to think that staying silent on human rights in China is a neutral act. Instead, every instance of silence just resets Beijing's expectations and it raises the psychic cost of re-injecting human rights back into the conversation later. Beijing still does care about its international reputation, meaning that both public and diplomatic pressure can be effective tools in encouraging change. My full recommendations are in my written statement, but I'll just highlight a few of them here. First, to maintain a clear, consistent, and full-throated public defense of human rights and religious freedom in Xinjiang in addition to direct diplomatic engagement. To work with like-minded countries, particularly Muslim-majority countries, to coordinate an inter international response to the situation in Xinjiang, and offer support to PRC citizens who have fled Xinjiang, whether here or in the United States or elsewhere around the globe. To limit private companies' ability to provide training or equipment to Chinese state security agencies, and the chair's recent letter to Secretary Ross is very helpful in this regard. And finally, to sanction right relevant Chinese officials under the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. Any sanctions pack sh package should include Xinjiang Party Secretary Chen Chuanguo. Sanctioning a sitting Politburo member who is one of, one of the top 25 leaders of the Chinese Communist Party in China would clearly and uh, convey the United States unequivocal condemnation of these camps. There's a list of ad additional leaders for your consideration in my written statement. Thank you for your time. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you all in your testimony. While brief has really gotten to the point, I want to start with the first one. You know, let me just make sort of an editorial comment at the front. And I know there's a lot going on up here. You know, every morning brings news, you know, depending on what's going on on Twitter, or statements, press, whatever it might be. But, and, and there's coverage here. There's people, there's some cameras and some journalists and others who may watch the, the later. I, I, what we've heard described here today has both deep domestic and international implications of epic proportions. I know a few of any sort of humanitarian outrages in the world that reach the level of what we've heard here described and few in modern history that reach this level. And I would dare say if this was happening in virtually any other part of the world, there'd be an incredible amount of outrage and coverage. And while I'm grateful to the journalists that are here covering this today and those that may write about it, I I'm disappointed. I'm, frankly, I'm disappointed that there isn't more interest, that there isn't more coverage. This is horrifying. It certainly is significantly more important for the future of the world in the 21st century. You have a country that is in a full-scale effort to not just catch the United States, but supplant this as the world's premier economic, military, geopolitical, and technological power. And history has taught us that the most powerful country in the world in any given era shapes that era, shapes the global norms, and shapes the way the world looks, feels, and acts. I think I deeply believe that, that America's rise, and particularly since the end of the Second World War, uh, has led to the spread of concepts about liberty, freedom, democracy, human rights, uh, economic opportunities, uh, and, and helped shape the post-World War II era. And so we have to fear that in a world that is shaped by a country, if that is what it reaches, that does this to their own people. You can only imagine what they would be willing to support, tolerate, and or promote if they ever reach the same status. And, and so I think this should inform our relationship and the urgency of all of our tasks with regards to our relationship with China, but focusing on this one in particular for a moment. Let me first address those, and, and, and this is, is going to deal with your story, Ms. Hoja, of those who say to us, and I've had people tell me this, um, human rights is important, but we have to be pragmatic and can't raise it in every forum, can't talk about it all the time, and at the end of the day, you know, the horrible things happening all over the world, we can't tell other countries what to do all the time. We need to be focused on America and Americans. Your story is about America and Americans. You are a United States citizen. You work for Radio Free Asia. And you have testified here today that your brother, your elderly and infirm parents have been detained, that over 20 of your relatives, including aunts, cousins, children, have been detained. You've also testified here today, I believe, in your written testimony, you may have said it verbally as well, that you know of other colleagues that have done the same. So here we have the testimony of a United States citizen working in a journalistic capacity whose family in another country has been harassed, detained, 
in some cases without any contact with their families, not knowing exactly what's going on, because they don't like what you are saying in the United States. In the United States. A United States citizen's family is being detained, harassed, and harmed in another country as an effort to silence you. And it is a testament to your bravery and courage that you have not been silenced and that you appear here today. I wonder how many have been silenced and how many have chosen not to speak and who can blame them? Who wants to put their family through this? You don't have to name names, but I'm interested in you sharing with us, for the record, whether in fact your story is an isolated one or is there in fact more people who find themselves in, their circum in the circumstances you're in. Again, I leave it up to them to identify who they are and, and, and so forth. But is yours the only story or are other people going through the exact same thing you're facing right now? Other U.S. citizens? Of course. There's um, even Chinese government right now put uh, the people to re-education camp who have a friend or family members outside of China. They feel they will influence them. That's why I, I don't know the number, but I believe everyone, every Uyghur, have somebody in the family or friends in the camps right now. Every, you can ask any Uyghurs, any, including my uh, five other colleagues in our office. And Rabia Kadir is here. Her sons, daughters, even grandchildren locked up. She doesn't know where they are, how they are. And we recently confirmed Dolkun Aysa's mother passed away in the re-education camps. So I wonder what evidence we have to prove again and again. So we've been trying to cover those darkness, the issues, more than one year. Because Chinese government, the Chin Chuan Guo, using this policy harshly from beginning of last year. But we've been, like, for example, me, 17 years, I've been releasing every day similar situations, similar human rights issues, abuses by Chinese. But <laughs> unfortunately, we are the only source. Radio Free Asia is the only voice to world to talk about ourselves. So is that enough? We don't know. And because of, I'm still here, I raising my voice because we don't have choice. We don't have any other people to talk, you know? So we are the hope. So I have to stand up. So I cannot give up. Thank you, Chair. I, I ask you this, and, and I don't know if you even know the answer. You, you may not, and it doesn't mean there aren't any people in these circumstances. But putting ourselves in that position, I think few people would have the courage that you've exhibited and the willingness to continue to speak, knowing the consequences of it. Um, do, are you aware of, or do you fear, do you have any sense or any reason to believe that there are those who have chosen, no one blames them for it, who have chosen to stop speaking up for purposes of avoiding what's happening to you? Of course, like, when I heard my brother was detained, I chose to not speak up to because my mother asked me to say, please, I already lost you. I don't want to lose my son too because I've been, and we've been, our family couldn't unite it in 17 years. I believe other Uyghurs have similar situation. Somebody locked up in the jail or detained or in re-education re camps. We don't want to put them further danger because of our act or any word against China. <laughs> Have, have in your time uh, talking about these issues, highlighting them globally here in, 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 in the United States, have you ever felt like media outlets, individuals, companies, whoever, have chosen to not 
speak about your cause for fear of the impact it might have on their ability to cover events in China, uh, their ability to do business in China. In essence, they may not have relatives, but they may have other interests in China that they are afraid that there would be retribution against them as a result, and therefore they don't really want to get involved in your case. And listen, this could extend from a political figure who doesn't want to touch it because they have a company in their home state who does a lot of business. It could be businesses. It could be media outlets who have a bureau and don't want to lose access to you know, a fast-growing and important country. I, I don't know if at any point you have felt that there are those who have been complicit because of their own interests, separate from having family. Um. And you don't have to tell us who they are unless you want to, but I'm just curious whether that extends beyond simply those who have family members. As I know, uh, if you want to interview someone who's uh, involved human rights issues or other issues, they're uh, doing their like investigation. Some of them like says, oh, excuse me, right now I cannot speak. Those kind of reaction uh, be facing all the time, but. I don't know the exactly company or the uh, the person. Maybe our uh, colleagues can uh, follow up that questions. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and again, we'd be interested in that. Uh, it could be done confidentially. I mean, we may if you choose for us not to share it. But I think it's part of the broader long arm of, of China, which I think goes well beyond. I mean, we've seen it at universities. There are universities in this yes. country that will not mm -hmm. provide you, sadly, a forum to yeah. say what you've just said because. They're going to lose their Confucius Institute funding, or they're going to lose their campus in mainland China. Yes. And so they decide. Even we, don't want we to were uh, some we were um, researchers in other uh, countries. They they have opportunity to speak. They have freedom, but they are afraid to. All right, um, I, Ms. Badke and Mr. Thumb, I wanted to focus on two things. Um, on our relationship with China, a lot's been talked about what can we do, how can we influence behaviors. But my experience is that there are two things they seem to respond to, and only two things. Number one is sort of sustained and committed pressure across the entire relationship, meaning the entire relate. you can't just carve out pieces of it and say, we're going to deal with trade here, but human rights over here. We're going to deal with military affairs here, but you know economics over here. They most certainly pressure. The, the, the strategy China seems to follow is not one of sweeping change, although when they, when they see an opportunity, they seize it. It seems to be one of slowly, steady, but consistent escalation. The South China Sea is an example. Every time they push a little bit further, creating a new normal every step of the way. And that's how they, and they pressure across the board. So today is very enlightening, right? The administration had an opportunity to sanction ZTE. They did. Uh, basically issuing a death penalty, um, allowed them to come back into business by allowing them to buy uh, chips from Qualcomm. Qualcomm had a pending deal in China, and the response of the Chinese after the ZTE thing got finalized is to continue to slow dance Qualcomm and American company until the point where they've abandoned their hopes uh, of doing business in China. Basically, they, have, they continue to sustain their pressure while we have given concessions on some things. I hope that was enlightening for the administration. I know it's unrelated directly to this topic. But the first is sustained and committed pressure across the relationship. And the second is something that Ms. Batke pointed out, and that is invoking international partners. They want to be one of the goals of the Chinese Communist Party in the 21st century is to remake the global order to benefit them and their, to replace sort of the Western global order that was established after the Second World War with one that has their imprint. And part of that is the perception and the receptability that people may have to that based on their perceptions of China. And so their perceptions of the Chinese Communist Party is that it is a country with a lot of money, a non-interference policy who is there to help you build things and move ahead without having to put up with some of the restrictions that American aid or Western aid comes with. That makes them appear benevolent and peaceful and, and in many cases continues the whole bide your time and hide your power strategy that they followed for a very long time. If the perception of them is that they do bad deals, they take advantage of their partners, and they violate people's rights, if it's a negative perception about the things they do, they're very sensitive to it because it goes right to the heart of their ability to re remake the geopolitical system. And that's why they are so fearful of sustained, uh, of our ability to invoke global partnerships to confront them. 
and, and why it's important that, that we continue to do so. It's a little hard to do when you're fighting with some of the people that might join us in that on trade, but hopefully that'll be resolved so that we can do that. So here's my two questions. The first is, why is it so important? I know why it was important in the context of the Cold War and the Soviet Union that in every instance, virtually every American president, in addition to raising Soviet expansionism and nuclear weapon threats, always raised the cause of human rights. If I were standing here today and say, look, China's too powerful, they're too rich, we got to do business with them, we can't afford to mess all of that up by raising these human rights issues, I've already outlined why I think it's important, and that is to sustain pressure across the relationship. But in your view, beyond the moralistic and humanitarian rationale, from a geopolitical rationale, why is it important that the United States, in every instance, raise these issues in every forum in which we engage them in? And a kind of, that's question one. One A is, why is it important that it be public? Because the other thing we get is, we're going to raise it with them, but in private, because we, they don't like to lose face. They don't want to be embarrassed. So why is it important we raise it geopolitically, just from a sheer national interest? And why is it important that some of that, or a lot of it, be done publicly, as opposed to in private one-on-one -on -one meetings? Um, if you could both comment on that. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, as uh, Jessica Backey pointed out, um, when things are not raised repeatedly, there's a, there's a reset of the norm. And you have to claw back that little part of the discourse to get it back on, on the table. And then that, is, that, that, comes, that comes at a cost. So I, I agree that it's important to raise this at every moment. And there, there actually is a legislative um, uh, opportunity here. There's a law in the books from the late 90s that says that um, Tibet has to be raised um, in, in certain circumstances. And it would be very v valuable, I think, to add the Xinjiang issue to, uh, to that piece of legislation. I would add, though, that um, it's quite dangerous to link this uh, Uyghur and Xinjiang issue to geopolitics. I heard the word blue seas earlier, which s invokes this kind of balance where if we intervene in, 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 in Xinjiang, then that affects this global military strategic situation. That plays in very neatly to the Chinese Communist Party's story about why they are why are they are engaged in this kind of activity and why they don't have to listen when people in the rest of the world say that this violates international uh, norms so I, I I would hope we story meaning that, that they're that the West is trying to con constrain and contain them from their rise the West is trying to constrain and contain and even that the West might have some sort of secret joy when there when there's uh, unrest or 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 trouble in in Xinjiang, and that this this can be used as a pressure point on China in our geopolitical rivalry. Um, so if if we don't separate those those concerns, we're going to have a great deal of trouble getting all of our international partners on board and undermining the CCP's narrative on, on, on why this is happening. And I'll also say, just briefly. I, can just add, I yeah. don't think you're saying it shouldn't be raised in every forum. If I take what you're saying is it should be its own separate category within the broader engagement, meaning you don't trade human rights for a better trade deal. That's, yes, sure, that's, that, I would accept that. Um, I would also say that we, we are thinking somewhat small here. Um, Senator King raised the long-standing criticism of uh, America's activities uh, in regard to 1930s Germany. Um, and I would remind everyone that that supposedly insufficient reaction included Roosevelt recalling our ambassador from Berlin. We are behind the curve on that reaction, which is considered historically now to be insufficient. Um, uh, Ms. Batke, Dr. Batke, um, raised the issue of terminology and, and pointed out that these nightmare words of the 20th century, concentration camp, apartheid, gulag, all started out their careers as euphemisms that were designed to hide the terrors. That's the point we're at now. But one day Xinjiang is, Xinjiang's re-education camps under one name or another are going to join that list of widely recognized um, uh, atrocities. And um, I think we have a responsibility to act boldly 
um, to address that issue. I'll second everything Dr. Thumb just said. In terms of why is it important to keep it, bringing it up all the time, again, beyond what he just said, um, there's this issue of ex the exporting of Chinese norms, as, as you were talking about, across the world. And I think that one thing that is important to remind other people is China touts itself as this country that does not in interfere in the internal affairs of another. But, but beyond the moral imperative of bringing this up, it's important to remember that when we don't, we are allowing them to interfere in our internal affairs and decide how we decide to bring up and frame things. And that's a point, I think, that can be brought up, again, to other countries in terms of why they should also be speaking up, because those norms are also being reset and exported to those countries. In terms of why it's important to um, keep these things public, kind of cordoning, cordoning off these conversations into only private discussions allows them to confine that discussion and allows them to walk away from things without any sense of shame or embarrassment. International pressure is effective. And I would point to the case of Liu Xia, who was just recently released from house detention in Beijing and, and uh, allowed to go to Germany. And that was a two-pronged effort. That was a lot of quiet diplomacy behind the scenes, but also a, a sustained and public campaign keeping her case in the public eye. And just on the public front and the versus private, on an individual basis, if there is an individual uh, case somewhere in the world and progress can be made because there's some internal political reason why they've got to be able to save face, that's one thing. But we're talking about the, the tension and, frankly, in my view, the torture, humiliation, and abuse of hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and it, more actually. and. Um, and that's why I don't, you know, in this particular, there's not one individual that they could somehow just sort of, if this is one person, and I'm not saying, I'm not downplaying that one particular case, but it, that's what we do on this commission. It's overwhelming. We could, we could, volumes of names, if that's what we chose to do in that regard. I do want to ask both of you, the second part about invoking international partners to confront it, it is my view that if something even a quarter as bad as this were occurring in virtually any Western democracy now or various other countries around the planet, it would not just get more media coverage, but it would be widely condemned in every international forum. There would be widespread action against it. I mean, it would be intolerable. Why isn't this occurring the same way? What have they done or what is happening that has prevented this from reaching that level of international attention? I suspect I know the answer, but I would love to see if you agree. So I'm not going to tell you my answer until you tell me yours. Sure. Um, I would say, quite baldly, money talks. China is very effective at, at going to countries one on one and um, making clear that they are happy to use their economic leverage as necessary to uh, get their silence. I think this is really clear in the case of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They've only issued two statements about what's happening in Xinjiang, one right after the Urumqi riots in 2009 and one in 2015, but they said nothing since all of this um, has been happening in the last year. And I, I strongly suspect that that has to do with um, economic concerns on their part. Yeah, I, d I don't have much to add to that. This, the, I, th I think you're right. This would be roundly condemned if it happened uh, virtually anywhere else. It would be, be a major news item. And I, I, I agree that this is, this, is about, this is about money and China's economic um, clout. It's not helped by um, uh, major powers like the US um, retreating from, from human rights concerns and putting economic concerns, um, concerns first. But uh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely what it, it is. It strikes me, and, and that's my agreement as well. I mean, that's how I feel as well. And it's not, obviously, money does talk, and, and Chinese investment abroad isn't simply into roads and bridges. I mean, they fund political parties. They fund individuals. Um, there's all sorts of things that, that come about as a result of this. And, and, and that leverage is one they made very clear. And they, we've also seen them, for example, cut off tourism to South Korea, allow agricultural products to rot at the port from the Philippines. Um, all in retribution for uh, deny rare earth minerals to Japan, all in retribution for decisions that were made in those countries. And so taking that as, an, as a factor, you basically testified here today that the reason why certain countries cannot internally make a political decision to confront this in international forums is because the Chinese are using leverage. We've heard how they go after the family members of United States citizens as leverage to try to silence criticism of their practices. And I think that's a pretty stark example of how hypocritical they are when they talk about their policies are of non-interference, when they are directly interfering 
in the affairs of other countries because they are interfering with citizens of other countries by going after their families. They're interfering with their political leaders by threatening to cut them off from essential aid and help. Um, they are shaping and interfering quite directly. And so the, the, the hypocrisy of that is extraordinary. I have one more question. We, we do need to wrap up. And Dr. Beck, it's, it's, I wanted to ask you about the testimony that you gave regarding uh, the Communist Party Secretary Chen Chuen Guo and his role within the leadership and the extent that he plays or the role he plays in the repressive measures. Uh, you, you've pointed to him as sort of the one individual that we should be looking at and beyond. Um, in your view, what, what would be the, I guess, the psychological, I, we'd have to view what the economic impact of it is and the like, but you've talked about it and you've described it as a pretty significant escalatory measure, one that would get attention, because for the first time you're not going after a country or even a party, but a specific individual. I know I'm asking you to speculate, but what impact do you think that would have internally among them, knowing now that if they are participants in this sort of activity, they are now individually going to be named uh, uh, in, in, in internationally as complicit in, in these activities? Um, you're right, I can't speculate about what's going on in their head directly. I, I don't think that it would necessarily stop people from choosing to participate. And, in, and as much as we talk about repression, I think also there's a lot to be said about um, the choices of people in government in terms of you know whether they feel like they can completely step back from what they've been asked to do. So I don't know that it would prevent other young people from joining the government and choosing to do this. But I do think it would be an incredibly powerful symbolic step, um, particularly because Chen Chuan Guo is so high up in the Chinese Communist Party. Um, rather than going after someone who's very low level, uh, running maybe a camp or something, although I think we should name and shame those people as well, um, this actually shows that the US government is unequivocally c condemning these camps and is willing to raise it to a very high political level to do it. And, and I, my last two questions, and, and I'll be brief. Um, on the first, you were here for the first panel. You saw the back and forth with the Commerce Department. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but what I took from it is two things. Number one is our laws may potentially need to be updated to include new things as part of repressive tools, you know, these tools that didn't exist before. But the other thing I took from it is we have to make, if, I'm paraphrasing, but the way I took it was we look at this product, the DNA sequencer, they're easy to do, they're not really that complex, although they, if there wasn't something unique about them, they wouldn't have to buy them from this company in Massachusetts. But nonetheless, they're not that advanced. China makes them, plenty of other countries make them. They can find it anywhere in the world anyways, and they have legitimate purpose. Um, if we deny it, they're still gonna keep doing what they're doing. The only consequence will be that some American uh, company will not be able to make money off of it. So since they're going to do it anyway, we might as well continue to make a profit. In addition to the immorality of that and the notion about whether we want to be complicit in it, isn't that exactly what they're counting on? The idea that they know that one of the most powerful constituencies in America are business interests who frankly don't feel like they have a human rights obligation. They feel like they have a fiduciary obligation to their owners or shareholders to return a profit. And as a result, for them, um, they bring to bear pressure on the United States. I see this in multiple realms, by the way, not just regard to China, but one of the most consistent arguments you always get is of the business community coming back and saying, you're hurting us. They are a, we have a good thing going in this huge market, and if you do this, you're going to hurt an American company. You're gonna, the, the Chinese government clearly understands that leverage point, and they use it. Do they not? Yes. Does anyone disagree with that? No? I, I agree with that, and um, I... The conclusion that leads me to is that whatever action the U.S. government takes is going to come at a cost. Um, it's going to come at a cost to American citizens, and it's going to come at a cost to the uh, the options on the table for for the U.S. government. This is about political uh, political will. All right. My final question is: If you're sitting in the Chinese Communist Party headquarters today and you're reviewing this policy. You probably aren't even aware that we're having this hearing, but the people who are in the embassy here are, and they are annoyed by it. They don't like this commission. They most certainly don't like me, and they, they get irritated when these things come up. 
But by and large, the world will go on, and tomorrow morning, this is not going to lead headlines here or anywhere, for that matter. Um, the work continues. There are people that are certainly being intimidated by it. They are, in essence, they're sitting there thinking to themselves, this stuff is working. No one's condemning us internationally. Um, we are continuing to do what we're doing. Um, we're getting better at it every single day. As time goes on, it'll get easier as young people get disconnected from their heritage and their families. Yeah, they'll have some commission hearings and a couple senators and congressmen will write letters and maybe they'll cut us off from a DNA sequencer one day and maybe a couple of our individuals might get sanctioned. But that's a small price to pay for the big picture. It's working. That's the saddest part of all. This strategy they are carrying out is working. That would be their view. And unless we change that dynamic, or at least raise the price for it, this will continue, it will grow, it will become more widespread. In essence, it'll become the new normal. It'll become baked into the reality. Am I wrong in that horrible assessment? Um, I think you're right about the, the attitude um, uh, that, they, that they have toward this, and you're right about the threat that this becomes baked in to a larger, a larger order. We um, see, for example, some of these technologies used in Xinjiang being exported. Um, to South America, but I don't think this is a hopeless cause because China's expanding influence around the world depends in a great, to a great deal on its reputation. And for that reason, its leaders are very sensitive about its global reputation. And so the more that we can do publicly and in particular in partnership with other countries around the world to expose what's going on and to shame the Chinese state for engaging in this kind of uh, behavior, the greater the cost will be. And I don't, I, I think it's a mistake to consider decision making as, as uh, at that level as something where they're certain about what they're doing. They see this as a balance of costs and, and benefits. And if we can add to the cost side, we may very well be able to, to, to shape the situation. And I don't disagree that this, with your assessment this is not a hopeless cause. In fact, I only think it becomes a hopeless cause if we accept it as a fact that we have to deal with. Um, and, and I raise that, the fact that it's working for the following reason, and that is we can have a lot of commission meetings, we're going to issue our report, we're going to file bills, we're going to write letters, we're going to give speeches, and we're going to highlight that as much as we can. But this needs to be prioritized at the highest levels of our engagement, both with China and the international community. Um, Congress is an important part of it, and we can even be the catalyst for it. But there is no replacing uh, executive level attention to this as part of the overall framework of our inter interaction with the international community and, and with China. And, um, and that is the only way that ultimately we are going to see that cost benefit analysis adjusted. Now, Congress can be a catalyst for it, individual senators and congressmen can be a catalyst for it, but the execution of it will require us to have a sustained, across both parties, across a sustained period of time, across multiple presidential administrations, an attention to this. This, this cannot be a one-off issue. And, and that's the only way we keep it from becoming hopeless, and, and that, that's why I ask that, because if we want some sense of urgency, we shouldn't think that simply shining a light on it alone is going to change that dynamic. We need the top people in our government, not just to be aware of this, but to be outraged by it and to embrace it as part of our overall narrative. And that's what we're hoping to do. Um, and that's what I hope the first panel took back. So um, I want to thank you all for being here, particularly you, Ms. Hoja. Thank you for being a part of this. I, I know you, this is an ongoing um, issue for you. After we leave this hearing here today, you live with this reality. But I. I thank you for your courage, your bravery, and your willingness to stand here today and, and provide that testimony. I thank you all for being a part of it. I know it takes time and away from your other uh, endeavors to be a part of this. The, the record on this hearing will remain open for 48 hours and, uh, in case some of our, you would like to submit any additional information for the record so it can be a part of our record and maybe even make it into our report before we issue it in October. And there may be some follow-up questions from members. If you have time to answer, we'd love to have that. And with that, the hearing's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.